welcome to Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, where we talk about gospel insights through great stories and help you find entertainment that is both true and beautiful. Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree is part of the Public Square Media Network of podcasts that seek to bring an LDS perspective into the public square. I'm Liz Busby, here with my co-host Carl Cranny. This season, we're experimenting with a new kind of short episode with just Carl and I, where we try to quickly talk about a movie together in less time than a regular episode. Finding and scheduling guests is one of the big, biggest time challenges on the podcast, so we're hoping that these smaller episodes make it easier for us to be consistent. But fear not, we will still be doing longer conversations throughout the season as well. Carl, can you tell people what we are going to be talking about today? In this short episode, we're going to be covering The Mission, a 2023 documentary about John Chow, an evangelical Christian who feels called to evangelize the North Sentinelese people, one of the last uncontacted tribes on Earth. It's directed by Amanda McBain and Jesse Moss and is available on Disney+. Plus. It is not to be confused with the 1986 film of the exact same name, The Mission, starring Jeremy Irons and Robert De Niro about Jesuits in South America. That's a wonderful movie, but it's not the one we're talking about today. So, Carl, what did you think about this news story when you first heard it? Because it, there was like a big to-do about this guy who had gone to preach the gospel to these people and gotten killed. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember it and my reaction to the story back in the day was about the same as my reaction to this documentary, which is, I'm so glad that I'm a Latter-day Saint. Because theologically, I'm just going to put my theologian hat on for a second now, this is not a problem that we Latter-day Saints have at all. Like, these people, first of all, we don't believe in traditional hell. So they're not going to, like, burn or be tortured with pitchforks and, you know, hot coals for eternity. We just don't believe in that. Uh, hell is like a forgotten corner of the universe where God's just, like, really disappointed in you. Go sit in the corner forever. Think about what you did, Lucifer. Right? <laughs> like, that's that's all we have. Yay for almost universalism. <laughs> That's the other point, is that we Latter-day Saints don't have to worry about, like, smuggling Bibles in or book, copies of the Book of Mormon into, you know, under, under the auspices of being tricky with the government people. We go in the front door, we don't go in at all, and if people don't hear the gospel in their lifetime, that's fine. We have baptisms for the dead. So I understood deeply John Chow's impulse to do this, and I find myself very sympathetic to him. He has taken a lot of the assumptions of traditional Christianity to their logical conclusion, and I find that commendable, even if it got him killed. And so the documentary to me was interesting because it deals a lot with a lot of that, and colonialism and, and white saviorism, along with personal revelation and inner family conflict between like different people who believe slightly differently. They're, his father and he are both Christian, but his father doesn't believe quite the same way he does. And so there were just a lot of interesting dynamics that the documentary brought out uh, that, I, that I really enjoyed. So you don't give any credence to all of those folklore stories about people receiving sealed mission calls that say, call this number? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Nope. <laughs> No, me neither. We do not. We go in the front door or we don't at all. Like, we believe in honoring, obeying, and sustaining the law. So there you have it. Yeah, I think that was really interesting. And another interesting piece of evangelical doctrine that I wasn't aware of that I found out through this documentary was this idea that the second coming won't happen until everybody's had a chance to hear the gospel, or at least every people group um, has had a chance to hear the gospel. And I thought that was interesting like this like oh well we have to hold up our end of the bargain before jesus can come and the reason he's not here yet is because we haven't done it i don't know if that's attributable to all evangelicals but certainly some of them it certainly was something he believed right right yeah we're just going on on john chow's belief and then we get into the interesting question of like what is a unit of people like who who how small does it have to get before Jesus is like okay good enough I'm gonna show up now and it's an interesting question I like to ask uh, even my evangelical friends like uh like John Chow how how finally do you have to split this before you know we've held up our end of the bargain I like the way you phrased that so I admit to have having been less charitable than you when I first heard of the news story. I was like, oh gosh, this makes us all look bad and crazy. But I feel like watching this documentary, although it's not necessarily like sympathetic necessarily to his beliefs, I thought it was fair about his beliefs. And I understood them a lot better watching the documentary, even while it's definitely not a religious documentary. No, it's not. It's made by National Geographic, I think, is the ones who filmed it. 
Yeah, which is why it's on Disney Plus because National Geographic stuff is on Disney Plus. And it's interesting because it takes pot shots at National Geographic and the way they treat indigenous people and the, the way they sort of glamorize them or... Or treated, hopefully. And, and so that was interesting to, to see National Geographic maybe doing a little bit of self-reflection by having this be part of their, uh, their movie library. Yeah, it was really interesting <laughs> to see the way that like things had been done in the past that now came to be used in a way that they probably wouldn't be comfortable with now. That that was how John Chow was doing all his research was from these old documentaries from organizations like National Geographic who had gone in and taken these pictures and tried to figure out anything about these people. It's uh, such an interesting question to, to see them wrestling with sort of their legacy as well. I thought it had great production values, though. Of course, John Chow isn't around because he he died because the North Sentinelese people uh, killed him. And they did get a long and detailed letter from his father, but they just had actors read both, like, John Chow's journals and Facebook posts and then the letter from his father, which was heartbreaking to sort of see the division of the two of them uh, slowly over time growing further and further apart and his father feeling like he failed a little bit. I feel like there's a lot to learn here from this documentary about interpersonal religious conflict or interfamily religious conflict. What do you do when you have a child who maybe is still a member of the church but is a little more liberal than you or, or maybe is a little more conservative than you? Like, how do you navigate these treacherous waters of doing interfaith work within your own family even within the same tradition, broadly speaking. I don't know, what did you think about some of that the stuff, the inner dynamics between the, the son and the father? Yeah, I loved the animation that they put with the reading of the diary and the letter. I thought that it was a really interesting effect. But yeah, you could tell that the dad felt really bad that he had just... It seemed like they had just chosen to agree to disagree and not discuss those subjects rather than have this kind of continual back and forth dialogue about it. So that was interesting. It's really hard to figure out how to deal with these issues with family members where you want to continue to maintain a good relationship, but you're also worried about how these beliefs are going to affect their life and their maybe their salvation or survival in this case. Choosing when to intervene on stuff, when to pull your parent card. I'm gradually adjusting as my kids are becoming teenagers to this idea that you have to pull back and let them make their own decisions sometimes. And I imagine that becomes even more of the case when they're an adult. Well, obviously, like once they turn 18 in America, there's nothing you can do. If he wants to go to the North Sentinelese people, you have to either kidnap him or let him go. Like those are your two options at that point. But you still have an obligation as a parent to try to teach them, but you have to go about it in a different way. Um, and so finding ways to have those open conversations, ugh, it's tough and important, in, as we see. <laughs> Another thing that I think Latter-day Saints could draw from this, even though we are obviously in the broad umbrella of Christianity, but just the interplay between like institutional faith and revelation and programs an individual revelation and calling. Discernment isn't a word we Latter-day Saints use, but lots of other Christians do. John's trying to discern whether this is a true calling or not. And man, after they like shoot the arrow through his Bible the first time, and then he goes back three days later and gets killed, part of me is like, uh, I think at that point you should have figured out that maybe this was more you than the spirit, because they talk about that wrestle a little bit. But he uh, never, I don't know. I mean, we just only have his, his journal and, and, and Facebook posts and recollections. But it seems to me he didn't quite wrestle with that as much as he should have. But who am I to interfere with somebody's personal revelation or comment on it? I don't know. But it's an interesting thing that we all have to, you know, navigate ourselves as well. Is that, is that me? Is, is that God speaking? Is that Satan? Is it a combination of all three? How do you suss that out? Well, good luck. Yeah, I really liked the comments from the pastor when they were talking about that specific moment where he said, did Jesus tell John, hey, you, you've done enough, like you should pull back and he didn't listen? Or did he say, hey, you need to make this sacrifice and it's going to be okay? I don't know. And I really liked that admission that like sometimes bad things happen to people who are trying to do something good and maybe we don't know 
whether it was because they didn't listen to a prompting or if this was a thing that needed to happen and maybe it will have consequences in the future. Which is why of all the people they interviewed, the one I found most interesting was Daniel Everett, who's a linguist who had studied with a, a different group of people in the Amazon jungle and tried to evangelize them and then ended up losing his faith over it. And so, you, like you talk about how it can have consequences, consequences can cut a number of different ways. And in the case of Dr. Everett, and he ended up losing his faith so he still goes and hangs out with this uh, particular tribe, but he's no longer, he no longer considers himself an evangelical Christian. Or I got the impression he's just like atheist now. I don't think a believer at all. Yeah, I think he's just an atheist now. So I, f I found him the most compelling of almost all the people they interviewed. He's such a fully rounded character. So it seems weird to call a real person a character. This is a documentary. There's so many facets to his story that I thought uh, we could dig into. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting, all the different facets of like the interaction between Christianity and Western culture versus indigenous cultures. How do you do missionary work without it being colonial, without having this white savior complex, which is interesting because John Chow is not white. He's uh, half Chinese. He's Asian. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I mentioned this to people, they're like, oh, yeah, I, when I heard that story, it was like white savior complex. And I was like, but he's not white. So is it a white savior complex? Maybe, maybe. Western savior complex, I guess, because he was raised in America. It was interesting that John Chow himself had thought about that. And he was like, oh, I don't want, I specifically don't want to be imperialistic about this or colonial. I want them to find their own way to worship God, which is an interesting aspect of it evangelical missionary work that we we wouldn't really buy. We're like, you can't just start your own church. We've, we've got structure here, but you could do that from an evangelical perspective, like start a church that fits with your own culture and your ways of doing things. That's not necessarily ours. Right. Absolutely. hundred percent. But the thing that was so funny is, and I don't know if they were drawings of his or if it was just the documentarians who produced this, but when he talks about, they'll find their own way to worship Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, but the picture you're showing me on the screen right now is like a thatched Protestant church with a cross on top. Like, you're still imposing some of your views on these people, at least architecturally. And so that was interesting. I mean, that's, I think, one of the major differences between us and evangelicals is, and, and, and I think this is something you can attribute to most evangelicals. It's just the the more simple idea of once you have prayed some version of the sinner's prayer and given yourself to Jesus, that's fine. The rest of this is good and important, but not strictly speaking necessary for salvation. So they have a lot more wiggle room and we have a lot less. <laughs> Well, yeah, a lot less wiggle room, and, and we have a lot more because it's it's baptism by immersion under proper authority, and then we have the rest of the covenant path to follow, whether that's, uh, you know, priesthood ordination for men, and then endowment, and of course sealing if you want to go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. There's a lot more going on in uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints than there is in evangelical Christianity writ large, and so those are interesting and instructive differences to see how their theology informs their missionary work and ours informs our missionary work. But it does remind me of how, like, as the church becomes more of a global church, we're trying to be more conscious of which parts of church programs and stuff are just Utah culture and which parts are the gospel. And like, what parts do we mandate all over the world and what, how much do we do local adaptation while still maintaining fidelity to the things that we think are important, like the priesthood and revelation and all these different ordinances that are important to us? Which is why I agree with the church's decision like six or seven years ago, whatever it was, to get out of scouting. Like, I think that's the right choice for the worldwide church, but my boys are going to be at Scouts because that was really good for me, and I liked that, and I'm, I'm missing that structure already to see some of the negative side effects of the narrowing down of what is necessary and sufficient to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as we become a more international church. Well, let's do some lightning round ratings unless you had anything else. Uh, nope, I just, I think it's interesting to see uh, this whole evangelical culture around uh, around evangelizing, right? It's literally in the name of their branch of Christianity. Uh, like the movie that John watched over and over and over again, The End of the Spear, about those missionaries who went and tried to teach that other tribe of people, then got killed. But then the wife and the sister of two of those dead missionaries went and did end up converting the tribe later on. This is a culture 
and a, a veneration of martyrs and things like that that we just don't have in the church as much. Kind of have a little bit of holy envy for it, but at the same time, I see the negative side effects in this very documentary, and so maybe I don't have holy envy for it? I don't know. It's interesting to see how much we push, you know, I hope they call me on a mission. We push missionary work very hard as well, but not in the same way, and don't valorize it in the same ways, uh, and I find that interesting. Speaking of scouting, it was really interesting to see how his choice to go to this really isolated group was also influenced by his love of like the outdoors and survivalism and living off the land kind of culture. So that was an interesting aspect to this story that I had no idea about from the news accounts of it that I saw. Right. That's an interesting Venn diagram. How he was kind of like an outdoorsy influencer on Instagram for a little while. Like, okay, that's interesting. Mission prep, sure, why not? Yeah, and kind of the argument between the different people of like, was he really an influencer? Was he doing this so people would think he had a, was like a shallow white savior complex. So if it went wrong, like how much 3D chess is John Chow playing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much plausible deniability is he giving other people? So yeah, that's interesting. It's a great documentary. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on to some lightning round ratings. For content, where would you put this, Carl? Oh, Celestial, it's fine. Like, you could watch this with anybody. Maybe a little heavy for younger kids, just because this is about a guy who goes to this island and then gets killed by the natives. There's nothing uh, objectionable in it other than maybe some uh, gravitas just because of the nature of the subject matter. There are, like, there is nudity in an indigenous people context. Oh, that's true. I guess I should mention that. But, like, when I watched The Gods Must Be Crazy as, like, an eight-year-old, I that was not titillating to me. Like, even I, as an eight-year-old kid, understood, like, it's not the same thing as Victoria's Secret. Oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm just saying, like, people should know going in. And also, um, I know that a couple of my kids who walked through were a little bit disturbed when it was, you know, the mission, and they're like, wait a minute. Thing, like connecting it to our culture's mission. So I would avoid showing it to kids who are like, can't distinguish between the two and now thinking that they're going to have to go to some remote island where no one speaks a language and get killed <laughs> for their mission. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. But I, you, you can navigate that with your kids. Celestial with caveats. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Um, artistic merit, one to five popcorn balls. I think this was a really well-produced documentary. I enjoyed it the whole time. There were a little bit of a few sections that were maybe repetitive, but not a ton. So I'll give it four popcorn balls. I'd give it five. I think as a person who believes very strongly in Christ and in the Great Commission, I feel like they treated those kinds of beliefs respectfully and also gave a good showing to all the reasons why the belief in Christ and the Great Commission can be misused even in the context of, of holding those beliefs. I thought they did a good job of just taking this and showing you all facets of it and doing so in a way that was I felt respectful to all the sides involved and all the people who gave their comments. And so there are a couple of moments maybe where they, they cut someone off where I've been like, oh, I would have liked the next couple sentences from that person. But yeah, that happens with every documentary. So, you know, five popcorn balls for me. Okay, and Gospel Connections, speaking of the Great Commission, what do you think? Five apricots, again. Like, it's about the differences in Christianity and culture and how to bring that to people and, and how does theology interplay with our missionary work. And yeah, five apricots. Lots of good discussions to be had. I'm going to go with four apricots, but I think I agree with you. Just like lots of good conversations about how do we ethically engage in missionary work and spreading a message we think is important while still acknowledging that there are differences between peoples and that those are okay as well. This has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, encouraging you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. We'll see you next time. 